is Jimmy Powers, and happy to be coming your way with another Grantland Rice story. Hi there, this is Jimmy Powers once again transcribed with another story from The Tumult and the Shouting, the autobiography of Grantland Rice. Today's story deals with Big Jim Thorpe, the American Indian, and I'd like to tell you this inspiring story in first person. The Indian is a great natural athlete. Given the same chance, he has the white man lashed to the post. His heritage is all outdoors. His reflexes are sharp. He takes the game, in fact, every form of life as it comes to him. He rarely gets excited or off balance. An example was Chief Albert Bender at Chippewa. A pal of mine, the Chief was a great pitcher, a fine shot, and an able golfer. He strong-armed Connie Mack's pitching staffs from 1903 to 1914. Mack told me he was once undecided whether he should pick Mathewson or Bender to pitch a game that meant a million dollars to him. When Bender pitched for the Athletics against the Giants in the 1911 World Series, I noticed that he often quarreled with Eddie Collins at second or Stuffy McGinnis at first. What was the fuss all about, I asked the chief. Well, he said, they're young. And assists to first or second, I was throwing them curves. I just wanted to let them know the World Series was just another ball game. I played a lot of golf with Bender from 1911 through 1914. Whatever game it was, he was a great competitor. Nothing ever bothered him. Bender brings up another even greater Indian. His name is Jim Thorpe. In many ways, Thorpe was like Bender. Nothing ever bothered him. Both Bender and Thorpe had the philosophy of the ages. At football, Jim was a brilliant ball carrier, a fine passer, a good pass receiver, a place kicker, a drop kicker, and a punter, and also a murderous blocker. Undoubtedly, the game's greatest all-around kicker, he raided Camp's 1911 and 1912 teams as a halfback. Old-timers may tell you Thorpe couldn't hit a curve, but he was a big league ball player. He was also a fine shot. And in 1912, he was a decathlon and a pentathlon winner at the Olympics in Stockholm. That was long before the long grind of training improved so many others who, as natural athletes, couldn't fan Jim's brow. Thorpe did little training. Francis Albertanti, who covered the 1912 games for the old Evening Mail, told me that going over on the old Red Star Liner Finland, Thorpe would sit alone while the rest of the track squad pounded a stretch of cork laid down on one of the decks. What are you doing, Jim? asked Albertanti one day. Thinking of your uncle sitting bull? No, I'm practicing the broad jump, replied Thorpe. I've just jumped 23 feet 8 inches. I think that can win it. He did win at 5 inches less. When King Gustav, a sincere sport fan, presented the gold medal following one of Thorpe's victories, the king uttered the accolade which Jim never forgot. Sir, you are the greatest athlete in the world. You had to like Jim. He was a very decent human being. He rose to great fame in a hurry and then sank. He was a gentleman, but there were times when firewater got the better of their long feud. Years ago, I went out to the ballpark in Rocky Mount, North Carolina one day with a local writer. On our way out, he showed me a big iron can about five feet high. This, said the writer, is where Thorpe stood our sheriff on his head one day, just picked him up and dumped him in upside down. The sheriff was trying to arrest Jim. 
The one man Jim was leery of trying to handle, however, was Warner. When Carlisle played Brown on Thanksgiving of 1912, Thorpe and Pop got into a heated argument over a drink Jim had taken that morning to celebrate the pact between the Indians and the white men in the Massachusetts Bay Colony. Pop gave Jim a hard riding. Late that afternoon, I ran into the referee who worked that game. I've just officiated at a game in which I've seen the greatest football player ever, he said. Jim Thorpe defeated Brown 32 to nothing all by himself. Runs of 50 and 60 yards were nothing. The Indian was a tornado. He wrecked the entire Brown team. The referee's name was Mike Thompson, one of the best. In the 1912 game against a strong army team, Carlisle was on their own 10-yard line. Thorpe dropped back to kick. Bill Langford, the well-known referee, dropped back with him. They think I'm going to kick, both us and Army, Thorpe muttered to Langford, but I ain't. After faking a kick, Thorpe ran 90 yards, and the Indians broke the game open and won 27 to 6. He was an unbelievable competitor, reflected Langford. The game has never seen his like. It was during Jim's junior or senior year at Carlisle that Lafayette was playing host to the Indians in a track meet. It had been well publicized, and a welcoming committee headed by Lafayette's coach Harold Bruce met the train. All were stunned when a party of two alighted at Easton, Warner and Thorpe. What's this, demanded Bruce. We expected the Carlisle track team. Here it is, replied Warner, casually pointing to Thorpe. Jim racked up practically every blue ribbon on the field in a rout for Carlisle. In street dress, Thorpe, like Dempsey, wasn't particularly imposing. Both were so perfectly proportioned that nothing seemed unusual about either man. Both scaled around 183 pounds at their respective peaks. In addition to having every needed physical asset, Thorpe had a rare spirit, reflected Warner in later years. Nothing bothered Jim. When he was right, the sheer joy of playing carried him through. When he wasn't, he showed it. For that reason, I used to call him a lazy Indian to his face. I'll admit, though, it didn't bother him. But when he was right, he was the best. The reason I picked Ernie Nevers over Thorpe as my all-time football player was because Ernie gave 100% of himself always. In that respect, he was a coach's ideal. Thorpe gave it only on certain occasions. It was difficult to know if Jim was laughing with you or at you. Down the last 15 years when Thorpe was up but mostly down, the circus saints and sinners in New York took an interest in him. Fred Benham, a New York publicist who handled the fall guy at those luncheons, was close to Jim. We were talking one night, said Benham, and I asked Jim if there was any material about him that hadn't been done to death in the papers. Yes, one thing, grunted Thorpe. I'm a twin. My twin brother died when we were five or six. How did it happen, I asked. We were raised on canned condensed milk, replied Jim seriously, and we ran out of cans. No matter what the sport, Thorpe was the complete natural. He could play tennis, he was a whiz at billiards or pool, and he was adept at those games long after his professional football days. Thorpe was a cornerstone badly used, but nevertheless a cornerstone of professional football from 1920 through 1926. His pro day started nearly eight years after he finished at Carlisle. The Canton Bulldogs in 1920, the Cleveland Indians in 23, with Rock Island in 24 and 25, the year he came to the New York Giants, and back to Canton for the 26th season, his last. With the exception of the Giants, those names may strike a weird note with neophytes, but pro football was built around those early franchises. In this respect, Thorpe was born at least 30 years too soon. In 1920, when the league was formed, Jim was already a veteran, an old man in the strict competitive sense, slowing down for that last painful grind through the home stretch of his career. By 26, he was barely getting by on a pair of scarred and weary legs, legs that had carried him through more competitive miles than all the campaigns of the French and Indian Wars. I seldom go out on limbs to crusade for individuals, much less a sport. My attitude towards public projects of this sort being with the sink or swim school. However, if ever an individual was pilloried by the shabby treatment he received from most of the press and the public, Jim Thorpe was that man. As a symbol of the greatest athlete of his day, if not all time, Thorpe should have been utilized 
by the Department of the Interior where he could have helped his own people, not after he had become a broken down caricature, but while he was a young man. Instead, he was allowed to live on the $5 a day he received as a movie extra when and if. The act that barred Thorpe could never be justified. What right did the AAU have to Thorpe's private gifts, fairly won in those 1912 Olympics? They merely robbed the Indian in a cold-blooded fashion. They have never known where those trophies were sent and have never offered to help retrieve them. I wrote several letters in later years to Avery Brundage, the Chicago contractor and keystone of our Olympic organization, stating the case for Thorpe. Brundage's replies were weak and implied a so what, it's dead and forgotten attitude. The treatment accorded Thorpe, in my opinion, is one of the cruel turns of all American sport. Since his death, Thorpe's body has been more in demand than it ever was during the last 20 years of his life. Civic do-gooders and chambers of commerce, both in Oklahoma and Pennsylvania, want his burial mound for a tourist shrine. It would be fitting that an effigy of the American Indian should stand prominently in the entry of the Indian wing at the Museum of Natural History in New York. That effigy should be a red, copper, life-size, detail likeness of Jim Thorpe, this country's, if not the world's, greatest all-around natural athlete. Well, I found that story very inspiring, and I hope you did too. Now, until next we meet, this is Jimmy Powers transcribed saying, the mostest of the bestest. <laughs>